just want to say I so appreciate every one of you for coming in today and uh, uh, having church with us. If you are visiting with us for the first time, thank you for coming. Thanks for taking a chance at uh, being in a new place with, with new people. And uh, we just want to tell you that, that wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, you're welcome here. And we, we hope you enjoy it. We hope you get something out of it. We hope that um, you come back. And um, if I haven't met you, I'd love to meet you before you leave today. So, uh, well, before we jump to the talk today, I want to take a couple of minutes uh, just to highlight one of the goals that we have this year for the journey. And I talked about this in a little more detail last week, but uh, several were either sick or out of town and, and not here. And if you missed the talk, please go ahead and go online to journeyboise.com and, and uh, listen to the whole thing. It's, it's a little more expanded. But uh, it's clear from Scripture that God passionately loves all people. And that he desires for all people to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to know him, and to be changed by him. That, and that means that God wants every person in this city, right? Every person in this valley. Is there anyone that he doesn't want? He wants Niner fans and Seahawks fans, okay? He wants all of us, okay? And um, he wants every person, not just church people, right? Right? Right, yes, yes. It's not tr- no trick questions right now, okay? Well, he, and he's established the journey here in this city to be a significant part of his plan. And his plan to reach every person with the love and power and message of Christ. And as I shared last week from a scripture that has been on my heart since leading up uh, and out of 2013 and into 2014, that is, it's time for the journey to begin taking more ground this year in 2014, to extend our influence in this city and in this valley, to pursue bigger and better as we've been talking about over the last few weeks, to enlarge our influence, to stretch ourselves and stretch our faith, to lengthen our reach, to strengthen our foundations, you know, and I'm excited about that, and, and I know that many of you uh, here today are excited about that as well. But one of the goals I mentioned last week is that is to hire a part-time youth director, a youth pastor, and to do so by the end of summer, if not sooner. We have a lot of young people who attend the journey. You saw a lot of them uh, get up and go upstairs. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, over 30, somewhere between 30 and 40 on a Sunday morning. We've been having almost 30 on Wednesday nights, between 25 and 30. And uh, you know, some of the um, young people, the students belong to you in this room. Some of the students uh, belong to parents who don't attend the journey as well. But many of the students are hurting in a lot of ways. The Native are confused, they're struggling. And we have a great team of leaders, as I talked about last week, that um, are serving them right now. And I love each one of them. I'm thankful for each of our leaders. And we plan to continue to grow our leadership team for the youth. Uh, But we need a point leader who can pour more time in than any one of us can, especially uh, some of the the young people who who need some more individual attention to uh, direct the the entire program and and so forth. Um, And and to come alongside the students who are facing all kinds of struggles and challenges that threaten not just their future, but their present today. And so, um, you know... We want to do that this year. However, we don't have the funds in our normal budget to hire anyone. In fact, we're having a difficult time as it, as it is just to make our bare bones budget, okay, um, as it is. And so I presented last week an invitation uh, to all of us, an invitation that I want to extend again today. Because I, I believe in what we are setting out to do. And, and especially if you weren't here last week to hear it. Wendy and I, and we're just being vulnerable, you know, we, we tithe on everything that we make as far as whether, on, on, on sorry, whether I, I, it's from here or whether it's, it's from child care that Wendy does or, or bookkeeping occasionally, uh, we give 10% back to God and, and through the journey is, is what we do. We don't make a ton, but on top of that, what we've decided, we, we, we've always done that, we always will. On top of that, because we believe in this, in this need, we, because we believe that God's directing us to do this, um, we're also going to give an extra $50 a month. We can't afford it, but we're going to make cutbacks even more in our own personal budget so we can do it. We wanna, we're committing to give $50 a month 
for a year into a fund to pay a part-time youth pastor. And what we want to do is um, invite everyone here to consider doing something similar as well. Um, you know, we've already had some positive responses and comments or commitments actually since last week. Uh, and so there's two things that we're inviting you to join us in um, so that we can extend the journey's influence and hit the goals that um, God is calling us to hit this year. And, and so first, first, I just want to ask that every one of us would take, you know, a look at what we normally give. Um, the journey just sent out giving statements for 2013 for, for you to use for your filing taxes. And just compare what was on there with your family income in terms of percentage. Um, and I just want to ask, consider increasing that this year. Um, if you gave, you know, 1%, consider giving 2% or 3% or 5%. Um, if you've given 5%, consider 10%. You know, in fact, I encourage that all of us do that. That's something that, that uh, um, God sets out in Scripture for Christ followers to do. But whatever your decision on that, consider joining Wendy and I in investing in our youth from now and into the future. You know, give something on top of your normal giving. Those of you who have elementary age kids that are here, in no time, they're going to be in the youth group, okay? Um, several, you know, in the last four years, how many of our, of our kids have we seen come up into, into the youth group and they're like, oh my goodness, we can't believe how fast they are growing. And so they're going to be there. Um, and they're worth it. Your kids are worth it. Uh, the kids who don't, uh, uh, whose parents don't attend here are worth it. And so please just ask that you talk to your spouse if, if you're married. Um, take one of the connection cards that's in the seat pocket in front of you. And just write your name down on it and, and put a pledge that, that you want to put down uh, for, for the year. And there's a, there's a bucket on the t-shirt table out there. You can just fold it up and drop it in there. But it would help us in planning. And I've already begun a search for a youth pastor. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about this year. And I'm excited about bigger and better things that God has for every one of us here, all of our families, and for the journey. You know, and, I, and I'm going to say this because I've seen it. God will reward you, okay? He will reward you. Anytime people step out in faith and sacrifice to build his kingdom, he will take good care of your kingdom, okay? He makes that very clear in scripture. And so I just want to encourage you to take some steps of faith this year and let's pray and believe God for, for bigger and better. And especially in terms of bringing on um, a youth pastor. Don't let it pass you up, okay? Let's make a difference. Well, today we continue in our new series called Bigger and Better. And I believe wholeheartedly that God desires for each of us to pursue bigger and better this year. Bigger and better with Him. You know, God is for you, all right? God is for you. He created you for more. He wants bigger and better for your life. He wants you to live out the fullest potential that he has created in and for you. Not that our lives are necessarily bad, but we often, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, we often compromise and settle for far less than what we've been created for, far less than who and what we can become. And God doesn't want us to settle. He doesn't want us to just settle for comfortable. He wants your life and my life to be significant, to accomplish something great, to be fruitful, to bear much fruit, as we looked at over the last few weeks, to know what it's like to dream and see those dreams fulfilled, to experience the satisfaction and joy of being part of something bigger than we are. And if you're a spiritually curious person here today, I'm glad you're here. My hope is that you'll hear something about God and the reality in which you live, in which we all live, and we all face, that brings perspective and hope. You know, if you're a Christ follower, I hope that you'll be filled with strength and vision today. Well, the, talk, the title of the talk today is Torch It, okay? Torch It. Now, I don't know about you, but I often have crazy dreams at night when I sleep, okay? And you can ask Wendy. Okay, some are crazy, others are exhausting, and then I also have an occasional spooky dream, 
okay? And I don't know if you guys ever have the spooky dreams, okay? But this last week, I dreamt that I walked into the church right over there on the corner, okay? The, the, the one on the corner right there, that one that right there, okay? And now, in real life, I've, I've been in there. I've met the pastor's wife, and she's, she's a really nice lady. Uh, she gave me a tour of the building and, and um, you know, had a great conversation and so forth. Um, I have not met her husband yet, the, the lead pastor. So in this dream, though, I walked into their church to meet and talk with the lead pastor, just to kind of, you know, say, hey, what's going on, okay? And, and so in my dream, I walked into the building, but the building looked different in my dream, okay? And they were having church service downstairs in their basement. And it was dark and, and, and kind of dingy. And I shook hands with their pastor. And we were whispering to each other, you know, so as not to disrupt the service. Kind of like some people like to whisper in here, not to disrupt the service. But anyway. But, so he leads me over to this, this back corner underneath this balcony kind of thing. And it's dark and, and so forth. So we can continue our conversation. And as I look around me, I'm seeing kind of from, from the, 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 the ceiling, I'm seeing these, these spider webs with, with these little spiders on them. And I'm getting a little bit creeped out. Okay, because I, I don't like um, spiders. And so I start to crouch down and, and try to move away. But it was like, you know, I moved into the wrong spot. And, and I can't see the pastor anymore. And now I'm lying down on the floor on my side with this big spider web above me with spiders coming down. And all I could do was try to scream for help. And so, I, you know, and all I could get out in my dream was, help, help. Help, help. You know, the pastor was gone. I was by myself. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm hyperventilating. I couldn't move. I was stuck, you know, because if I moved anything, I would touch these spider webs. And so I'm there, help, help, help. And suddenly I felt this arm nudge my side and wake me up because I was saying help in real life. And Wendy <laughs> woke me up, okay? So, which I'm very thankful that, that she did. But, uh, you know, let me tell you, I, I hate spiders, and I hate, I hate that feeling of being stuck and not being able to go anywhere, not being able to, you know, move or whatever it might be. Whether I'm stuck in traffic or, or at a red light or whether I'm stuck in the snow because I decided to go off-road four-wheeling in my truck like I did when I lived in Sisters, and I was heading home at night, and, and there's all these forest roads, and, and I'm like, yeah. And so I... I, I, I broke through one of those berms, uh, like a three-foot berm of snow, um, and went to go four-wheeling, and I got stuck. And so I had to get out of the truck and walk all the way home at night in the cold and go get um, a flashlight and a shovel and a piece of wood to try to get myself unstuck. But anyway, bad decision. Um, but no doubt, you know, okay, you know what it's like to get stuck, and I'm sure we all have stories we can tell about getting stuck in something. But what's even worse than getting stuck in traffic or in snow or an elevator or like when Michael was four years old and, and he got a coffee bean stuck up his nose. Um, and I was like, do I try to get it out of there or do I just wait for him to grow? You know, I, <laughs> fall out. I don't know. But, you know, uh, what's worse than all of that is getting stuck in life and feeling like we're stuck in life. We can hear, you know, we hear about bigger and better. We love the idea. We get excited. We even start believing that maybe God just might want that for us. I can move forward. I can succeed. I can uh, be the best. I can find God's will. I can get out of this rut. My marriage can get better. You know, and so we get our hopes up. And then a year later, we realize that, that nothing's really changed. Circumstances are still the same. Life is still the same. You are still the same. We, and, and, and we feel stuck if we're honest about it. And if God has called us to bigger and better, then why do most people not experience that? Why do so many of us say, stay stuck? Well, life has always been like this, and life is always going to be like this. You know, we, we get into those modes of thinking. And what we're going to look at today is so vitally important to pursuing bigger and better in your life, in your home, in your job, in your walk with Christ, in your significance on, on this earth to move forward, to get unstuck, to step into bigger and better, it requires us to do something that most people 
don't want to do. Most people refuse to do. We have to set some fires. We have to pull out the blowtorch, light some things up, and let them burn. Before building bridges into a new life, sometimes we have to burn bridges to an old life. Okay? One of the Bible guys that we're looking at in this series, his name is Elisha. And uh, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, Elisha was just an ordinary guy living an ordinary life. Okay? Working hard, plowing behind, um, plowing fields behind a team of oxen. Not something that most people dream of doing for their career. All right? I don't know if you ever had a dream of plowing behind oxen. I want to do that someday. You know, no, none of us, I don't think, have, and probably the same that, uh, back in those days. But one day, in the middle of the dreariness of staring at the backsides of oxen while plowing this hard field, the head prophet of Israel, Elijah, okay, their names sound similar, okay, shows up. Now, nobody really knows if these two guys ever knew each other before this day. But Elijah, he walks up to Elisha and throws his cloak on his shoulders, okay? And immediately, Elisha knew what that meant. God had called Elijah to invite Elisha to become his apprentice and train under him to become a spokesperson of God to a nation, okay? Bigger and better things were on the horizon for Elisha, okay? And, and it was an exciting time in his life. And so let's look at what Elisha does. It'll be on the screen here. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. Poor guys. He, uh, he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then, they set, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. So first, Elisha takes his oxen which are his only means of making a living, okay? They're not just available cows. They're his only means of making a living. And he kills them so he can have a big barbecue with his buddies, all right? And except for chowing down on a good steak, it seems like a waste, right? Why would you just do that? I mean, good night, almost kind of foolish. Why cook the oxen? Right? Pirates of the Caribbean. Why the rum? You know. Anyway, uh, why cook the oxen? It doesn't. It's just. It's kind of strange. But he doesn't stop there. He also uses his plowing equipment to barbecue the beef. He torches his plows. I mean, why not hang on to them, just in case things don't quite work out with Elijah? Why not hold on to them? You know, just in case maybe things don't pan out as a prophet for you, Elisha. And if you're not going to keep your plow, man, at least recycle it. You know, take it down to restore or, or something. You know, someone else can use it. Okay. Now, why did he burn the plow? I believe it's because Elisha understood something about God and pursuing bigger and better that God had for him. And so if you want to take notes, there's a green sheet in your handout. Let's look at setting fires. Bigger and better requires burning some bridges. Okay? You see, Elisha knew that we can't step into a new life first without first torching whatever it is that binds us to our old life. We can't step into bigger and better without first setting fire to whatever it is that ties us to the ordinary or the mediocre. Now, it sounds extreme, it sounds overboard, and because it sounds extreme and overboard or even unnecessary, most people don't do it. Most people hold on to things. And most people miss out on a new life thinking that they can have both. They miss out on bigger and better. You know, I can't lose weight if I don't burn the bridge to the fridge, right? Okay, I mean, that's just, that's just kind of a, it's just what happens, Okay. One day while Jesus was walking and along and teaching, he invited someone to follow him, just like he did with his 12 other disciples. And this man was excited, and he said, Great! Yeah, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus', Jesus response sounded almost cruel. He said, Let the dead bury their own dead. Follow me. You know, when you read that, you're like, How dare you, Jesus? How dare you be so mean? I mean, you know, I mean, 
My gosh, he's Jesus. He shouldn't talk like that. He should be nice and just pray for the poor guy who lost his dad. And then Jesus should go to the funeral with flowers. And, you know, and I mean, what would Jesus do, right? You know, and we, we think, think that's just kind of mean, you know. Well, Jesus wasn't Mother Teresa, all right? Jesus was Jesus. But see, Jesus knows human nature. And he knows life principles. And he knew this guy. That the bridge between this guy, this guy's dead dad... And maybe that bridge was family, maybe it was friends, maybe it was an inheritance. But the bridge between this guy's dead dad and his following Christ was something that would get in the way and it needed torching right there. And so Jesus said, hey, let the dead bury their own dead. If you really want to come follow me, let that happen. You know? and, but just like that guy, you know, a potential disciple whose name we will never know There are things in our lives that get in the way of better. There are things that we need to not just let go of, but burn. When the prostitute poured highly expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, she wasn't telling Jesus that his feet stink. Okay? She was burning a bridge to a lifestyle that kept her from God and his best. She didn't just, you know, she didn't tell Jesus, I'm sorry for my prostitution and then hold on to the perfume that helped her get some of her business. No, she emptied it all. She said, I'm burning this bridge because I want something better. And Jesus, I believe you have that for me. Okay? We have to do, next point here is we have to do whatever it is that chains, we have to burn whatever it is that chains us to mediocrity. Jim Collins, the author of a book called Good to Great, said this. He said, good is the enemy of great. And he went on, he said, and this is one of the key reasons why we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools, principally because we have good schools. Few people attain great lives in large part because it's so easy to settle for a good life. Jim Collins, good to great. And he's right. How many of us would look at our own lives or these parts of it and say, yeah, I've settled for good, or even worse, mediocre, you know. We often refuse to burn bridges or plows or chains because we like to play it safe. And there are things that we just don't want to give up. We're often told that burning bridges, well, you know, that's a bad thing, you know. And sometimes it is. Burning bridges with good people because you're having a bad day is not a good thing, all right. And I know some of us have have done that or seen people do it. But we often take this belief that burning bridges is a bad thing and we apply it to every part of our lives. When so often burning bridges can become the best thing that we will ever do. Especially when that bridge chains us to mediocrity or to worse. Now like what someone else said, they said this, sometimes you have to burn a few bridges to keep the crazies from following you. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. All right, you know, but you got to burn the bridge, okay? Uh, Next, here, we have to burn whatever keeps us trapped by the past. I love traveling. I love adventure. I love excitement and doing new things. I've been to a few places around the world, uh, Africa, East Africa, Israel, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Hawaii. I've been to more than half the states the United States. You know, I love to travel and, and, and explore and just have a great time. And when I travel to places that are far, I like to bring home souvenirs. And so my office is decorated with some of those souvenirs. Um, that I've collected along the way. And my closet has a number of shirts from other countries that I will never wear, okay? And, uh, and so Wendy, she has so often said, Mike, can we just throw that away? Because she's into, you know, um, purging, and I'm into keeping. And so here's one of those shirts that I got from uh, Sri Lanka, and, uh, and you can see why I would never wear it on a regular basis, okay? Uh, it's actually a, a kind of a nice shirt uh, for, for standards over there, I guess. But anyway, so um, <laughs> what's that? It is kind of Niner colors. I mean, that's why I bought it. You know? Hmm, hey. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, these shirts, they, 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 they take up dust in my closet, uh, and, and the reason that I won't get rid of them is because they have sentimental value to me, all right? No practical value whatsoever, because I'm not wearing them, okay? But they bring me great memories, 
And, you know, Americans, we Americans, I think, are often sentimental people. But too often we get sentimental about the wrong things, things that trap us in the past and keep us from moving forward. It could be a job. It could be a relationship. It could be a way of thinking or believing. It could be a habit or a tradition. It could be sin. You know, we're sentimental about the souvenirs that we've collected along the way. Like I get sentimental about this. I'm like, oh, it's your long ago, you know. And when God says it's time to move forward, it's time to go up or out into what he has for us, we can't be sentimental about our souvenir collection. We have to get ready to torch them if he's saying it's time to move forward. I remember when I was a kid, you know, my dad, he loved Elvis, okay? He had this sentimental relationship with a dead musician, okay? And, uh, you know, okay, well, Elvis is the greatest, well, maybe, okay? Uh, he also loved country. But anyway, um, he, he, and so my dad would always sing these Elvis songs and other songs in the 60s. And my brother and I would say, Dad, you're stuck in the past, you know, listen to some new music. You know, they just made some new ones. And, you know, and we'd always get on about that. And now my kids say something similar to me when I pull out my 80s playlist or, or put on Bob FM or whatever. And, you know, I'm not as bad as my dad um, was, but, you know, we get sentimental. We get sentimental about things. I know pastors who I've heard, often heard talk about the glory days of ministry way back in the day, and how God's spirit moved powerfully in their churches in the past, you know, and the different things that God used in the past to reach people and change lives. And those stories are good. Memories are fun. But what does God want to do today? Or what about tomorrow? And what if he wants to use something new? And here's something that, you know, Paul the Apostle, he had so much to brag about. He had a ton of success in his life prior to his faith journey with Christ. And in one of his letters, he said that he now considered all those things as good as trash. Okay? And then he went on and he said this on the screen. He said, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what is behind, and straining towards what is ahead, I press on to win toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And there are some things in your past and in my past that I believe that we need to forget and take a blowtorch to. They could be failures. They could be hurts, disappointments, dysfunctional relationships, dreams that were never meant for you, maybe untrue, untrue words that you've believed, successes, glory days. It could be people that God doesn't want you to associate with anymore because of the influence they have over you and they keep you stuck. See, the past always stands as a potential threat to our future. And certain bridges that keep us trapped there have to be burned if we want to move forward. You know, there have been a lot of bridges that I've had to burn in pursuing God and the better plans that he has for me. Early on, some of you know, I, I wanted to be a, a CPA, an accountant. Why? You know, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you why. But anyway, you know, or work with business finance and investments. Is, is, I was going in one of those directions. Uh, and so, you know, because when I was in high school, senior in high school, I was dating this one girl who her dad was a successful CPA. And he owned nine houses in San Francisco and had a Mercedes Benz. And he had uh, this really cool sports car that he let me drive, you know. And I'm like, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I want. I'm going to follow in his steps because I want to make a lot of money. And so, you know, uh, so I set out to pursue that. I went to San Francisco State for three years. And when God had called me to follow him, I had to set those things on fire. Three years of San Francisco State University. You know, a good position with Hewlett Packard. A couple of girls I dated. I, had to, I actually torched them, but you know, burned the bridge, right? Okay? And not at the same time. I didn't date them at the same time. Anyway, so, but let me tell you, there, there have been times in my life when, when God's plans for me have been tough. And Wendy's going to beat me over the head when I get home. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been, there have been times when God's plans for me have been tough. And I've been tempted to cross those bridges back to where I was going before. But I couldn't because they were burned. And that was a good thing. Okay? 
And th- there were plows I had to burn when we moved from Central Oregon to Boise. The, the parsonage that we lived on uh, in an acre in National Forest, it was beautiful, high-end house that we lived in. Uh, you know, uh, I had a measure of financial security there. Uh, some great relationships that we had built. We lived in in an area that other people, you know, Sisters was an area that that other people who didn't live in Sisters would work all year, so they'd go on vacation in Sisters. And like, and we live here. You know, this is awesome. We live in a vacation spot, you know. And and, uh, Wendy's parents were here, by the way. Those are Wendy's parents, uh, Mike and Sandy. They're here here visiting. Um, But they moved to Sisters in part to be with us. And... They attended our church. Our kids got to have grandparents nearby. And that dy- dynamic of having grandparents close was something that we had to burn. And it was hard. It was not an easy thing. Um, the relationship obviously wasn't burned. So, you know, but, but that dynamic had to be. You know, I managed to make sure that it was clear. So anyway, uh, but, but one of the difficult things about following God into bigger and better is that he often wants us to agree with burning the bridge... First, before he shows us the details, okay? Kind of like the person in your life who asks you for a favor but won't tell you what it is until you say you'll do it. You ever had that before? Or maybe a parent or maybe you do that to your kids, all right? Um, I used to do that as, as a youth pastor. I need a volunteer. Oh, me, 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 me. You know, and they come up and, and I'm like, all right, get the shaving cream, you know, uh, or, or whatever it is. And they're like, oh! Um, but but that's, that's, that's kind of how God works sometimes, okay? The next point here is God rarely gives the details first, all right? God speaks to our hearts. He says, I am for you. I am with you. I have something really, some really cool things in mind for you. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to be successful. You're going to be significant. Your life will make a difference. Your marriage will improve. I have bigger and better for you. Follow me. And we're like, okay, great. Show me the map, God. What does it look like? How will it happen? There's silence. (laughs) Okay, maybe you didn't hear me. And so we repeat ourselves. And then we hear, follow me. Start burning some bridges. But but, but God, how will that happen? Silence. And it can be so frustrating. You know, it's just the way that God rolls. Moving from Sisters of Boise to start this church, we didn't know the details or how or the who's. Um, to do it with. Uh, we didn't know any of that. The building that we're in right now was a possibility, but we didn't know that for sure. Uh, at, at the time in, in, in Foursquare, uh, when we were first moving out here, our, we were in the same district as Bend, Oregon. But in the transition when we moved, they changed the districts. Okay? I'm like, did they do it against us? I don't know. Anyway, they want to get rid of us. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they changed them where now we're part of a different district. And so after we moved, we're like, oh, by the way, you need to probably make sure that it's okay with that district supervisor. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're like, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, we weren't even sure of that. And there were just a lot of, we just, but we knew that God was saying, come out here and, and start a church. We didn't know a lot of the who's and what's and and so forth. Um, we didn't even know where we were going to live until a few days before we moved here. And when our real estate agent called us and told us that she found a short-term rental uh, for us. Um, you know, I didn't know where I would work to help support this crazy thing. But we had to burn the bridge. I had to resign my church that I was pastoring in faith and just follow. See, God doesn't want to give us a guide with all the details Because God wants to be our guide. And that's the next point. God doesn't just want bigger and better for us, though though he does. He wants us to know who he is. He wants to reveal himself to us through the process. He wants us to know him. He says, I will be your guide. See, God is a a one-day-at-a-time God. I have greater things for you. Burn that bridge, torch that plow. Then I'll show you what's next. And after that, I'll show you what's next after that. And when you enter into bigger and better, better, you will also know me a little bit more. That's what God wants for us. Knowing God more is just one more component of pursuing bigger and better. You know, we can read that God provides, but it's another thing to experience his provision 
and know him as provider for me personally. We can read that he's good, and it's another thing to experience his goodness personally. We can hear that God heals, and it's another thing to experience God's power in healing. It's, an, it's one thing to, to know that, oh, God is wise, and it's another thing to experience his wisdom in our life given to us at the appropriate moment. And so he takes us on a journey toward bigger and better with him. It's a big reason why God doesn't give us the answers up front. If we knew the path toward bigger and better, then we would just run that path without God. And you know how I know that? Because I've tried doing that a lot of times. Uh, Thanks, God. Appreciate that. You know, but then we don't know him. And it's not that God wants to confuse us or frustrate us. There's something else in the way that, you know, uh, in the way that he leads us. Next is, is God wants to develop us. You know, and this is, this is about experiencing real life change. Change doesn't happen if there's no change. Okay? I mean, kind of common sense, right? And what we're talking about today, bigger and better, is experiencing change. Real change. But change doesn't happen if there's no change. Okay? It's not just about a change in circumstances or results. God is interested in who we become, not just in what we experience. There's another guy in the Old Testament named Joseph. And this guy was the, the guy with a coat of many colors. Okay, you may have heard of him, sold into slavery by his own brothers who hated him. The dude went through hell, okay? Sold as a slave, deported to a foreign country where he had to learn a new language, new skills, new customs, and he didn't know anybody. Things start to go well for him, then he ends up in prison, falsely accused of being a sexual predator. And this was a guy who, when he was 17, God had given him dreams, okay? Not of low-hanging spiders in a church basement, okay? These dreams were bigger and better than that, all right? Uh, Dreams of him being in a place of significance and significant influence, where even his own family, his own brothers, would actually bow down before him. You're like, what kind of dreams are that? And in the end, God makes it happen, okay? Through a series of God-directed events, Joseph is promoted to second command in Egypt, second in authority to only Pharaoh himself, you know. And in that day, Egypt was the world power of that region. And as a result of Joseph's leadership, he saves Egypt and all its people from starvation. He saves his own family who was to become a nation as well. And yes, there is the part of the story where his brothers actually do, literally, bow their knee to him. Okay? Not because he was being, you know, um, a lord at all, you know, ogre. Okay? You'd have to read it. But just like the dreams. But here's the thing. When Joseph was young and God gave him those dreams, Joseph was a prideful, arrogant, little punk. Okay? He was daddy's favorite. He knew it. He loved it. He relished in the thought of his brothers bowing down before him one day. And he wasn't, at that time, a person that God could trust. See, God knew that in order for Joseph's dreams to come true, it would take a different Joseph for that to happen. He couldn't lead Joseph into bigger and better and ruler of Egypt without developing Joseph into a person of humility, brokenness, and character. Joseph had to change for the bigger and better to happen to him. You following on that? That is so important. Okay, and it's no different for us. That's one reason why God gives us, doesn't give us the details. It's also a reason why God calls us to pull out the blowtorch and burn certain bridges that not only keep us from bigger and better, but also keeping us from becoming bigger and better people who can handle the greater things that God has for us in our lives. God is so for us and so has so much incredible love for us that he not only wants more for us, but he wants us to develop, wants to develop us so we can handle the more that he wants to give us. And that's often a part of the story that we don't like because we just kind of, you know, it's easy to what? Settle. No, I just kind of like who I am. You know, I don't need change. I like this, I like that. I'm going to hold on to this, like hold on my shirt, you know, whatever it might be, okay? Um, 
The writers of Scripture often use a word that is in some way related to this, and it's called repentance. Repentance starts with a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. And church people most understand it in terms of sin, walking you know, away f- from walking away from God to walking to God. But repentance also has to do with burning bridges that hold us back. Repentance is necessary not just to humble ourselves and confess and be forgiven and say, I'm sorry, God. Okay? But it's necessary if we want actual change in our lives. If we want Jesus to lead us forward, repentance is necessary. It's the first sign of surrender. And when it comes to pursuing bigger and better, the fruit, the abundant life, the significance, there's always an exchange that has to take place. We can't have bigger and better while holding on to the mediocre. High-level results don't come by holding on to low-level pursuits. Change doesn't happen if there's no change. So let's look quickly at, as we close at getting unstuck. How do we get unstuck? First of all, um, yeah. First of all, take inventory. Take inventory and identify what needs torching. For a lot of us, this process, process won't take very long. Okay? There's likely at least one or two things that are popping into our minds right now. All right? Bing, bing. Write them down. Don't ignore them. But even if not... Pray some simple yet honest prayers as you take inventory of your life. God, what is it? What bridge or plow do you want me to burn? What is chaining my life? What is chaining me to a life that I've gotten comfortable with? What good have I settled for in exchange for great, at the expense of great? Where am I mediocre or worse? You know, some of us have settled for such low standards in in areas of our lives that's not even mediocre. And God's saying, burn that, man. Woman, whomever, okay? And it's completely damaging you as a person. It's damaging to your character, to your faith, to those around you, even in your own ability to believe because it's so substandard. For Elisha, it was a plow that he had to burn, you know, and a tasty set of grilled oxen, you know. Uh, For Peter, it was his fishing boat, how he earned a living. For Paul, it was his accomplishments as a religious leader. For the prostitute, it was her perfume. For the woman at the well, it was her coping mechanisms. For Moses, it was his, his whole set of excuses. For me, it was certain dreams. But what chains you to less... What ties it to the same old, same old? Is it a bad habit or an addiction? Is it a relationship that's not healthy? Is it a job that doesn't line up with what God has called you to? Is it a passionist attitude towards your job that you have where God has called you to stay? And he says, that's got to change. Is it a small way of thinking or a small view of God? Is it pride or arrogance or refusing to forgive someone? Is it... Is it um, is it the high level of trust that you place in money? Or maybe a life that's, that's just so safe, you know, a little too safe. Is it an unhealthy desire to control everything? If you want God and his, what God and his goodness wants for you and has for you, you have to do what most people are unwilling to do. Just torch it, which is the next point. Just torch it. Grab a gasoline can and a match. Buy a flamethrower or some C4. Okay? Burn it. Blow it up. Burnt bridges are like heaven's incense. Kind of like burnt cows on my barbecue. Okay? <laughs> it means something good is coming my way. All right? I mean, that's just... Just light it up. There's no better decision you'll ever make because, and here's the last point, the greater cost is in refusing to torch it. It's in, it's in giving up the greater for the lesser. The greater cost is in refusing. It's, it's the athlete giving up a pro career because he won't give up the drugs or the attitude. It's spouses giving up the marriage because she won't let go of her anger. It's the man who gives up on his family because he won't give up time from his job. 
Jonah was called by God and could have been a great prophet and changed many more lives, but he was not willing to give up his prejudice and his anger towards anyone who was not a Jew. And so he made a difference once, and then God never used him again because he was unwilling. For the rich young ruler who approached Jesus in, in, the, in the book of Mark, New Testament book of Mark, chapter 10, he wasn't willing to sell his possessions. Burning those bridges was too extreme for him. And so he walked away from Jesus sorrowful, never knowing what he would miss out on with Jesus. In fact, he walked off the pages of history without ever, anyone ever knowing his name or what his money could have done. Burning bridges will open doors to possibilities that none of us can ever imagine. Refusing to burn them leaves those doors sealed shut. Shut. Just after the rich young ruler left Jesus, Peter told Jesus, he said, hey, uh, Jesus, I hope you noticed, but we left everything to follow you. (laughs) Okay? We burned some pretty big bridges, Jesus. Okay? And here's what Jesus had to say. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, and with them persecutions, by the way, and in the age to come, eternal life. The rewards for burning bridges are so much greater than the cost. Remember Elisha? We began this with. He ended up becoming more powerful and influential than his predecessor, Elijah. The Bible says double. Peter walked on water. How cool is that? Okay? He used to fish out of water, and I guess he walk on it, okay? He also saved souls. Paul worked miracles and turned a whole world upside down, and his work is still changing lives today, 2,000 years later. What could torching a few bridges do for you and me today? What kind of confidence, clarity, identity, purpose can we know in our lives? Imagine the bigger and better joy and peace that we can experience knowing that we're in the sweet spot of God's will. This is what he's called me to. This is the life. What kind of success can we experience? What kind of influence can we have on those around us? What kind of impact can we make in this world in the short time that we're here? Will we be remembered as a person who always played it safe, settled for comfort, had to be in control, held on to bridges and dumb shirts, (laughs) had a nice collection of plows, and lived for ourselves? Is that how we'll be remembered? Or will we be remembered as a person who wasn't afraid to burn bridges? Live life to the fullest. Follow Jesus wholeheartedly and set a world on fire with a life fueled by love and a pursuit of bigger and better and all that God had for them and others. What greater things will happen if you and I begin to set a few fires? I want bigger and better for every one of us. Every one of us. I want it for my life. I want it for every individual in this place. I want it for this church. I want it for the young people in our church, all the way down to nursery age. God wants it far better than I do. And he says, are you willing to torch some things? Are you willing to burn some bridges? You're willing to make that sacrifice and let go of what keeps you from pursuing better. He wants better. Let's stand. Of God, thank you for your goodness to us. And I know that this is a challenging talk because I personally have to live it. But it's not just have to live it, I get to live it, God. It's hard being humans, Lord, to let go of things that keep us from moving forward. It's hard to let go of things that we love or that we feel safe with. 
that we feel a sense of security with, especially if those things are good. They may not be great, but they're good or mediocre or less. God, I pray that you would help us to see and feel the passion for which your heart burns for us to experience more, to experience bigger and better with you. Help us to be willing to, not not just willing, but to just do it. Just burn some bridges that need to be burned. And enter into a new life that you've called us to enter into. To know you in the process because you want to be our guide. And to be changed as well so that we can handle the bigger and better things you have for us. And so God, I pray that you would bless each person today with the sound of your voice and your call and some clarity and some assurance. And for any who choose to burn some bridges today, God, will you bless them and will you open some things up so that they can see that you're with them and you're for them and you're not going to let them go. So thank you, God, for each person in this place. Um, Bless us as we move forward.